so yeah, guys, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, a very warm welcome to everyone in the chat um, and potentially any other people who are coming in uh, a bit later. So that's fantastic. So um, our webinar today is how to eliminate wasted spend um, specific to Google Ads campaigns, although truth be told that can actually be applied to Microsoft Ads as well. Um, my name is Fraser Smith. I'm Head of Client Services. And I'm Rory, Managing Director of Clean Digital. So we're a specialist PPC agency. Uh, we're based in Edinburgh. Uh, this is our 10th year and in our 10 years we've uh, audited and ran uh, accounts, maybe over 100 I would say, uh, well, well, well over 100 actually. So um, this is uh, just I suppose our top tips of what we've seen um, in relation to right now, I, um, a lot of Google's recent changes. Um, and we're hoping that look, there'll be various people at various different uh, levels of experience on the call. Uh, just hoping that anyone can get something away from this webinar. Obviously, um, we'll send the slides through after. Um, and if you don't take anything away, we'll obviously give you your money back. So uh, in terms of what we're going to go through today, so some key takeaways. Um, if conversion data isn't perfect, don't expect performance to be either. Um, reduce bids if budgets budget is capped and um, that's uh, quite a, a reverse one that Fraser will talk you through. Uh, there's a sneaky location setting that can lead to non-target clicks. We'll talk through a negative keyword strategy um, because negatives are key to reducing waste and the age-old question search partners good or evil. Uh, we're also I think the main bit of the, the kind of webinar is a, a bit of a Q&A because there'll be very specific problems that um, people on this call will have and so I want people to be uh, asking in the chat but also um, we're gonna for the next few weeks open up our time to just if there is any specific questions or concerns um, either myself or Fraser uh, can help out in the coming weeks so uh, yes that's a kind of little snapshot of what we'll be going through. So without further ado key takeaway one uh, inaccurate conversion values. So um, it's it's one of these things where it's probably the biggest uh, thing we notice when we look at an account and the biggest source of waste is that the uh, Google Ads account isn't speaking to what the um, business is actually trying to achieve. So um, there'll be likely a lot of people in this call who have got this issue, don't know how to fix it or um, or just have experienced it in the past. So. Um, a good analogy for this is um, a horse with its blinkers on. So a horse with its blinkers on, it's Grand National Week, so it's quite relevant, but a horse with its blinkers on can only see what's directly in front of it. And that's exactly the same with Google Ads. It can only optimise um, with the, the data that's pulling through. And, and usually we see it's things like online leads or revenue. And, and look, that can be great. It's very important metrics to go towards, but um, if your business is looking for something else, which businesses often are, rather than just um, cookie track leads or revenue, we need to be passing that information back through to Google Ads, whether it be in strategies or just the data that we're pulling through so we can optimise automatically or manually with that. So that's the horse with its blinkers on, just looking at online leads and revenue. And look, it's a much happier horse here. Um, it's It can see... Uh, Ideally, you want to pull anything that's relevant um, to your business back through. So think if you're a, a lead gen company, if, if you get emails to sales rep, if they're some of the, the leads that have the, the highest value to your business, making sure that Google Ads knows that rather than just online um, quick leads that, that's currently being pulled. Similarly, things like phone calls, make sure you've got phone call tracking, getting the value of those phone calls. Um, a massive one which we're going to come on to is uh, lead quality. So a lead is only as good as the quality uh, it provides. So most businesses talk in sales, not in leads. Um, similarly for more for e-commerce, things like profit margin, so key to businesses, things like churn rate, lifetime customer value and priorities, business priorities within um, product themes or, or services are so important because not all products are the same, not all services are the same. So um, having distinctions at value level at all those stages are very, very important to being able to get the most out of the campaigns and reducing waste because there will be a lot of waste if um, your account's got the, the blinkers on and just going after one, uh, one metric. Absolutely. So uh, here's the first example. Uh, so it's for lead gen. I know there'll be people on the call who've, who've experienced maybe lead gen or e-commerce, but there's a lead gen example. And look, we've, we've blown the uh, 
webinar budget on that lovely logo there. So it's for Phoenix Insurance. It is a it is a fake company we made up. And um, so the business objective for Phoenix Insurance is to get as many insurance customers as possible. And uh, a customer is made possible. They, they fill in a lead form. They fill in uh, then when they're um, past the lead gen stage, they fill an application form after speaking with the sales team, then they're in the approval stage and then they become a customer. And on average, 20% of leads turn into an approved insurance customer. So the ad account setting is set up so all campaigns are set up to maximize online leads. So that's when, that's the very first stage here. And target CPA auto bidding is enabled. So Google has its blinkers on and it's looking to try and maximize that specific goal. The issue here is, not all leads are of the same value um, and yet target CPA and Google believe they are or they optimize like they are. Um, so I uh, just one example of probably a hundred that you could pick out here in terms of differentiators within um, a, a lead or the audience that's pulling through. Um, but let's just say 35 to 50 year olds, higher disposable income and the, and the rest of it, they convert from a lead to sale three times higher than 18 to 24 year olds. However, um, Google, if, if Google doesn't know that, we're not informing Google that there is a difference between those demographics, then it will just treat uh, a lead from an 18 to 24 year old exactly the same as a 35 to 50 year old. So that's a big issue. It's There's a lot of waste there because we should be bidding up higher for the the, the leads that have got the higher propensity to go through to, to application and to become a customer, uh, whereas that won't, that won't be happening in the current setup. Um, similarly, another kind of linked issue is online leads are tracked, but not things like general inquiries or phone calls. And again, it's one where um, as a business, you need to have a look at where all the, your customers are coming from and just get in Google Ads the, all, all the key touch points that really make a difference to your business. Make sure they're tracked and pulling through to Google Ads. Otherwise, there'll be areas that are driving lots of phone calls. And if phone calls are important to you and you're not tracking them, you're missing out on that value. And in 2022, I think everyone needs to really scrap for um, showing the value of campaigns with, with all the kind of issues with cookies and the rest of it. Um, so the solution for Phoenix Insurance is to ensure all meaningful website actions are included in the conversions column and um, also pulling in post lead data to the platform. Again, I could do a whole another webinar or session on this, um, but there's like Salesforce or CRM hookups where you can pull through all the relevant information, um, but anyone can pull this information through Google Click ID. Um, so that's just a, a, a section in the lead form that goes through to your CRM. All you need to do is it's a alphanumeric bit of code that you pass back through to Google and then you can see what happens post lead. It sounds more complicated than it is, um, but that's really key because that would solve that first issue of um, would notice the consistently the leads that are turning into applications or um, customers or, or final sales. And then assign re actual, ideally actual or real um, conversion values based on uh, the relationship to customer sales. So um, you want to be optimizing more towards applications and customers more than leads, ideally, because obviously there'll be a difference in, in different people at lead stage. And again, it's one where that alone, again, could be another session. We can talk about that and go through lots of different scenarios, but um, really just starting with something, having a lead being less worth less than an application, and which is worth less than a customer as a conversion value, and then changing that, optimizing that value, either based on real values or just a hunch value to begin with and optimizing that is better than just optimizing towards the leads. So that's super a bit complex, but I suppose hopefully there's a little few nuggets that people can take away there. And then, um, yeah, you can maybe have a think about your own business and apply to that. And again, great logo here for Joe's Sneaker Club. This is for e-commerce. So the business is set, the business objective, it needs to make profit to pay wages, to get stock in. Uh, they aim for 20% year on year profit to increase and, and fuel business growth. And um, if you look at the account settings, they're targeted to optimize towards return on investment at revenue level. So revenue, not profit. Uh, and again, it's just one where a lot of e-commerce get it really great optimizing towards revenue and return on uh, ad spends. However, um, there could be massive differences in margins between product uh, levels. So um, think of 20 10% margin on socks versus 40% margin on trainers. You, If Google is tunnel visioned and trying to optimize revenue at an ROI, 
it doesn't care about margin. So um, that's one big thing. Another one is lifetime customer value. That's something that I think advertisers should cons increasingly consider a new user in the door as a customer, they could buy 10 trainers over the lifetime. So you need to assign more of a value that could that can come at your ROI target or your, or your profit target, um, like an extra value to a new customer you drive. Um, in terms of the, the profit led optimizations, again, I could do a whole other webinar on this, but an easy way of doing it, i.e. you don't need to do too much with business data and feeds is, is just splitting campaigns out logically, which we'll come into, but you obviously all the lower margin products are in campaigns together, whether it be search or shopping, and um, splitting out naming conventions and labels just to make sure that we we can manually see, we'll look at and accept a lower ROI in this area because we know that the profit's higher. Um, harder, but the harder method, but where I think the, the industry is moving to is dynamic feed imports and, and using CRM first party data to pull all really relevant information back into Google Ads. So Google Ads conversion value isn't revenue, it's whatever the value that you are, are assigning to products, whether it be lifetime customer value mixed with profit. Super complex, but um, I, I suppose I just want to get some people to start thinking about this, that if you're just focusing on things that are ROI at, at revenue level, unless that's the core aim of the business, then there's probably um, some waste in there because, yeah, we'll be spending lots of money on things that are driving revenue, but not necessarily the, the business outcome uh, metric. So, yes, quite in depth, quite quickly. So, I've really thrown in at the deep end here, but um, hopefully, it gets some people thinking. And as we say, more than happy to help with some specific questions on transitions after the webinar. Perfect. Thanks, Roy. That's fantastic. Um, so, on to our key takeaway number two. Um, speaking specifically about capped impressions. Um, and let me just preface this section by saying we do audits all the time as an agency. And fundamentally, I believe this is the single biggest thing that we look for immediately when looking at an audit in terms of understanding is an account wasting spend or not? And is there an opportunity to improve performance in a very short amount of time? So impression share. What exactly is it? So a very quick lesson on impression share. So an impression, hopefully many of you should already know, um, is when your ad is shown and that is uh, relevant to Google, it's relevant to Microsoft and also so social platforms as well. Speaking exclusively about impression share, which is on search platforms, um, we look at the total number of available impressions within your campaigns. Um, and again, that will depend on your campaign type, shopping or search, and also the match types you're using as well. Where it comes to impression share, that is the percentage of impressions that your account is showing on, be it a campaign, ad word, keyword, for example, relative to the total number of impressions within that market. Um, and again, just taking an example such as Amazon, um, Amazon showing about 80% of impressions, which is massive. Um, it's very unlikely that many other businesses can compete in that scale um, and to you know have a 100% impression share is very unlikely. Um, so hopefully that covers that. Um, and again, taking an example more relevant to a specific campaign, um, Jimmy Chu um, have fictionally came to us and said, Clean Digital, we want you guys to sell more of our new diamond trainers. Rory and I are actually wearing a pair today, um, but we maybe just keep that under wraps. Um, so we're tasked with how, how to sell more of these shoes. So we need to look at what's available in terms of impressions. Um, and the way that we'll look at that is splitting up our our keywords um, based on the likely search volumes and intent of those users. So again, we're wanting to sell more diamond trainers. So what better keyword to pick than diamond trainers itself, um, which as you can see here is very limited number of monthly impressions available, only 1000. But the keyword is super relevant to what we're trying to achieve as a business. So we're happy to have a high impression share on on that term. Um, going further along there, we're going a bit broader. We're opening ourselves up into the designer trainer market. There's a lot more um, products available there, lots more manufacturers. And finally, the entire trainer market in a month. Massive, bringing in non-designer brands such as Nike and Adidas. It's unlikely we're wanting to touch that, if at all, um, but there's much more impressions there for us to go after. And again, this kind of comes on to a bit of business modeling. 
Um, if we just jump to that next slide here. So again, the kind of TAM, SAM, SOM model. So understanding your total addressable market, the area of the market that you feel um, that your business can uh, actually be serviceable to, and then likely your final obtainable market there. So really, um, when we're looking at Jimmy Chu, the uh, diamond trainers is that SOM before we're extending broader and broader. And it's really important to kind of segment your campaigns that way. Um, otherwise, again, that in itself is is wasting spend. Um, so again, there's two kind of key reasons here um, why um, your ads may not be appearing in all impressions. Um, and the first is budget. Um, you're potentially um, not spending as much as you need to. Um, and the second is ad rank. Um, your position in the options is too low and you're actually wanting to increase bids. But good for you, there's actually plenty of options of how you can remedy that. Um, so the first is lost impression share by budget. This is an indicator um, that your spending level at present is preventing you from reaching more impressions on a day to day basis. Your budget is being exhausted faster than <clears throat> the number of impressions that are available to you on that day. And again, secondly, that lost impression share by rank is indicating you actually need to push bids up um, in order to show on more terms. But before we get to that point, we feel as if there's a lot of opportunity there. And this is the main thing that we look for um, when auditing an account. So um, when you see that a campaign or ad group or even keyword has um, got, to be quite frank, any um, percentage lost by budget, there's a massive opportunity there. Um, and there's two ways that we can that we look at this in terms of uh, being a PPC agency. The first is increasing budgets. You spend more at the current bid levels, you'll get more. Although the way that we think is that the most efficient way is actually by decreasing bids, which sounds counterintuitive, but by actually by decreasing bids, you can spread your budget much further, assuming that your conversion rate will remain stable, which again, why wouldn't it if it's on a core number of terms? which are continuing to perform well, your ROI, your CPA, your ROAS will improve. And if we just jump to the next slide, we can give an example of how this kind of plays out in, in a kind of real sense. So again, a fixed budget of a thousand pounds per month. And again, you're focusing that on key terms. So your conversion rate there um, in blue is also stable. Um, initially, when launching the campaign, you may look to introduce one pound bids, but then over time, you're actually seeing that you can actually pull those back and in turn, make that budget go a lot further. You're getting a lot more clicks, which again, in turn, with that stable conversion rate, allows you to get a lot more conversions as well. Um, and you can see there that the efficiency gained pretty quickly over time allows you to get a lot more conversions than you initially started with. Um, I will advocate to be cautious with this. Uh, Google Ads and Microsoft Ads is auction based, which means there will come a point when your ads will drop out of auctions completely and you'll lose those clicks. So it's really important to kind of uh, pull back incrementally or decrementally um, and ensure that you're not dropping out of auctions completely, but still maximize, maximizing the amount of clicks you're getting from your campaigns. So you may turn around to yourself or kind of us and say, OK, what is the best approach that I can make in understanding the changes I need to do to my campaigns to make them more efficient? Well, again, it comes back down to that search loss by budget um, number. And again, in this kind of you know, example campaign, campaign one, we're seeing that metric is extremely high. Um, you're losing out 90% of impressions um, in any certain, you know, given day or week. Um, we are really advocating there that those bid reductions are really, really aggressive. We're suggesting 50% plus. But as that number trends down following you making those changes, as you can see in campaigns two and three, the bid changes become less aggressive. So it's all about that kind of bit of a seesaw, trying to find the right balance between maximizing uh, the number of clicks you're able to get whilst pulling back those bids and making sure your campaigns are as efficient as possible. So just to kind of summarize the kind of main points there, so it's very, very important to structure your campaigns based on kind of priority, be it levels or tiers, and understanding um, the kind of impression volume that's available on any keyword terms uh, and drawing that back to the likely conversion rate of those terms that they'll have on your site. Impression share is key and use it as a guide for opportunity and measuring that in your accounts. If budget is capped and there's no room for scaling that, actually look to pull back bids and you can get a lot more clicks for your budget. Um, if you are maximizing impressions and there's a lot, you've already kind of made those changes to budget, actually, you know, we're advocating, you know, absolutely push bids 
uh, and you can get a lot more volume on those keywords. But there's that comes secondary to pulling back those bids, making sure that's efficient as possible. And finally, again, as an industry, you know, we're speaking here about manual changes in an account. Um, to be honest, you know, the industry has moved. There's a lot more kind of smart campaigns, target ROAS, target CPA. To be honest, the fundamental ethos of these changes applies the exact same. You can still change the campaign settings in terms of your bidding strategies uh, to accommodate maximizing the number of clicks that you're able to get for your budget and see the similar results you'd get from manual campaigns as well. Great stuff. So key takeaway three is check location settings. So uh, first uh, first off, before we go any further, is uh, you want to just double check that if you are want to target the UK, you've got United Kingdom as the country target, because sometimes we see that like people have been too broad with their um, target settings and they're targeting the whole of the world, for example, I've seen that a few times. So but let's just assume that your campaign has got the correct country target and you want to target the UK. Um, you put in that as your target location. I just want to uh, outline that's the equal signs with the cross through it. So the default setting means that ads can show out with your target location, which seems very backwards. And it's again, I think we mentioned at the start, it's a sneaky one from Google because this is the default setting. So it's all in the English is used here. So this is the default setting. So it's presence or interest. People in, regularly in, or who've shown interest in your target lo target location. So it's really that we've shown interest because the regularly in is is not too bad. I think I, I think it's something like when people are traveling to and from and, and based on device settings, they can they know that they're more of a UK user than a France user if they're going back and forth from France, for example. But the shown interest in um, is particularly it's more for lead gen companies, I would say, but it can impact e-commerce too. But if you've got products or services that um, someone out with your target location could show interest in. So it, it, particularly when there's a location involved, um, basically Google can say, well, oh, look, we think that someone from this country or this location is um, is is relevant to this ad. So we want to get the click for that. So yes, it's it's a big one. It's one where um, for a lot of our clients, it's um, or, or a lot of the accounts we've audited, we notice straight away that you know, even though the target set and says one country, they're getting a lot of traffic from the rest of the world. So here's like a visual example of that. And um, so uh, there's an advertiser where, you know, the majority of clicks were come from the UK, but the setting was the UK. They only wanted UK because it was a very UK centric um, service. And in actual fact, 21% of clicks and 33% of leads were originated from non UK users. So that can be um, fine for some companies. It's like, OK, we're expanding our reach and the rest of it. But for other country, uh, other companies, it's, it could just be seen as a straight up waste of money because the leads will never convert through to sales at the same rate as uh, people from the UK. So look, it's a, an absolute massive one. And uh, I suppose everyone on the call can have a think about if if they'd ever want that to happen. I would always say if you want to target anywhere else in the world with your campaigns, have a different campaign for that and use that as a country target within the campaign because um, as we said earlier about different age ranges converting differently from lead to sale, it's exactly the same with different geographics due to a whole host of reasons. So um, yeah, it's definitely one to check. So um, first thing in the account is campaign settings. So if you see that blue tick on presence or interest, then um, you might want to change it to the just present. So it, it, on the presence uh, feature, it will just show to people in or regular in your target locations. But what you can do is a bit of an impact analysis because this setting could be on your ad accounts and you might fear the worst. But in actual fact, you're not actually showing too much in, on non-target non locations. So what you can do is go on Google Analytics and um, split by uh, audience, geo, location and then country. Uh, and then pull in the source medium of Google CPC if you've got auto tagging. And on this, this is this is the example from the previous slide. So, um, you know, 10% of, of clicks will come from India, 5% US, 5% Bangladesh and the rest of it. So uh, that was when we noticed uh, we were able to make that change and it just made the traffic perform a lot better. So yeah, definitely a sneaky one um, and, and one to look out for. Great, perfect. So um, on to key takeaway number four, um, utilizing negative keywords. Um, so again, the kind of main overarching point here is optimizing your search terms, which 
really may seem like the bread and butter of search advertising, but there's been specific changes to how um, Google uh, specifically uh, use and leverage their match types, which now in 2022, um, unfortunately, it means that advertisers need to be extremely cautious with what terms they're matching to, because there's you know a range of intent that can happen, um, even matching to you know one keyword there. And to be honest, even on exact match these days as well. So um, again, another really fantastic logo, uh, fake uh, company that have made up, Joe's Sneaker Club. So they've tasked us with um, selling their new range of Nike Air Max 95s. So um, as a good PBC agency, we bid on the term Nike Air Max 95. It's very, very relevant uh, and we should get as um, a good proportion of traffic that we're able to then use to sell on the website. Um, however, after launching the campaign, we quickly look at the search term report and we see a broad range of terms there, as I've, we've indicated on the right there. So um, that first term, buy Nike Air Max 95, absolutely, we want that traffic. The users indicated that they are wanting to buy the product that we sell. So we should be wanting to get as much of that traffic as possible. Um, however, this is when things, as you can see, start going a little bit broader. The inclusion of, of, of colour terms such as red, do we stock them? You know, it could, the example here is red, it could be blue, it could be green, it could be pink. Do we stock that colour in? If not, then we don't want to be a bit appearing on it. And um, the inclusion of Foot Locker there as a competitor, do we want that traffic? Sometimes, sometimes not. Um, and then as you go down in reviews, that's potentially not someone who's in that buy now phase, depending on how the performance of the campaigns are going. Can we allow that user to be seeing an ad? Potentially not second hand. We don't sell second hand. And then finally, Nike Air Force One. That's not a product that we want to sell specific to this campaign anyway. Um, so we're wanting to not match that in auctions. Um, and again, so how do we approach this? So again, we are really advocating um, adding in negative keywords um, across the account. Um, and there's several ways that we can do this. Um, some are more efficient than others. So um, you can apply negative uh, keywords at both ad group and campaign level, um, and you can very easily, when you're going through your search term report, um, you can actually click on the term that's matched and add that as a negative to either ad group or campaign level. This is good, and we're definitely advocating for it, but there's much more efficient ways to do this, and that's actually through the creation of, of negative keyword lists. And in the next slide here, we'll kind of demonstrate why that's so useful. So um, I think all good PPC accounts should have a universal negative list. Um, there's some just terms that you never want to appear there, um, business to business case, but absolutely the same principle still applies. Um, so we've got some examples there. We're applying that across all campaigns. Um, we're just selling Nike trainers for uh, Joe Singer Club. Um, so again, we've included some other non-stop brands there um, that we don't want to match to. Again, that's particularly important on Google Shopping. If you're running shopping campaigns where Google will take your feed data and match it based on the data that's in your feed, not to keywords that you've specified in your account. So extra important for Google Shopping. And finally, on the left, uh, on the right there, sorry, um, we've got non Air Max 95 terms. So different products that are Nike related. Um, but not that we're wanting to apply. So if we've got an Air Max 95 campaign, absolutely we're applying that list to that campaign and that should go a long way into allowing us to match to more relevant terms. Um, and again, I've mentioned it's the kind of bread and butter of kind of good PPC campaigns, but I really wanted just to kind of highlight an example of how important it is to look at your search queries often um, and then draw some conclusions uh, based on the performance there. So again, you may be looking at your campaigns and seeing um, that terms are appearing. Again, we've gave an example here of used Nike Air Max 95, five clicks, one pound spent. Let's not cry over spilt milk here. It's one pound. Um, if we lose a pound, it's not the end of the world. However, you know, if in doubt, zoom out is always a good um, expression to use for PPC campaigns. So when we're looking across um, the performance of specific to the, the term used, across any search term in the account. We, we zoom out, we see that actually it's had 1.5K clicks and 400 pounds spent, which again, depending on advertisers, 400 pounds is a lot of money. Uh, we don't want to be wasting that whatsoever. So um, we could see that, you know, the performance is not there when we're using used and that budget is better reinvested into terms that will perform a lot better. So what we're advocating is that looking at all queries, splitting them out into individual words, commonly referred to as n-grams within the industry, and understanding the performance 
uh, the performance from those terms over a large set of data. We use uh, Ngram reports via Google BigQuery, although there's absolutely some scripts that are available within the industry which can do the exact same. So uh, it's so important to look at search terms, take some learnings from them and um, apply them to your campaigns. So key takeaway five, thanks for that Fraser. So is review search partner performance and actually it's more on um, in a campaign, from a campaign perspective, um, at network level review networks at search partners i'm going to go into a little bit in google D display network as well i'm sure most people on, on this call uh when talk google ads we're talking about um bidding on keywords on google search the property of google search it's high a high highly reputable um company when you're showing your ads on google search and showing against competitors so picking the keywords that you want to bid on and um, the reason why i'm, I'm drawing this um is a, is a really big one because we often go into accounts and um, basically Google has a default setting so that your ads can show on non Google search um, specific placements by default. So um, specifically search partners and Google Display Network. Um, and look, it's one where there can be instances where you absolutely would want to show on those networks, but I think it should be the choice of the, the advertiser to to choose that to, to decide if they want to go down that route. I'd also say just it's a bit of an elephant in the room in this presentation and otherwise performance max is coming. So Google is really doubling down on leveraging machine learning and taking asset groups and coming up with a campaign across all touch points, which you know it, that, that campaign type has merits. A lot of this presentation is, is quite focused on probably existing search campaigns where you can make sure you're not wasting budget on there and also to to moving forward how you can keep things in a, in a good order um, it's a whole different conversation performance max we can maybe touch on it in the q a um, but yeah i'll just go through so if, let's just assume that we're we're trying to to buy keywords on google search so an example here so a law firm wants to set up a search campaign in scotland for search keywords such as lawyer to write a, a will a family law so they want to get customers who are writing those keywords in click on their ad come to their website and read a bit about it and hopefully fill a lead form or phone them so uh, in here, just just to show you what the process is like. So you select campaign type search, you see performance max there, but you've got other options here, display, shopping, discovery, and the rest of it. But we're just focused on search. The campaign settings, there's two click, two, um, you know, quote unquote, sneaky settings that are auto enabled. So one is search, the search partner network here, and the other one is Google display network. So first off, what are search partners? What is the search partner network? And um, it's basically, um, when any other website uses Google search within their own um, domain to make searches, um, that's basically a search partner. Uh, they can be a search partner network. So any advertiser, or sorry, any website can become a search partner by signing up to Google custom search engine, so CSE. And so, for example, The Guardian here have done that, and so of ask.com, you'll see lots of different search engines, which are basically just Google, but have got more ads. Um, so, um, yeah, any company can, can become a CSE, so at Clean Digital, we could become a CSE, and any company can make money from those ad clicks, like a share of the, the, the ad cost, if they have AdSense linked to their CSE. So it's automatically getting the, the ball rolling in terms of the incentives for you know, publisher, so to speak, and and Google to to maximise the placements here. So, a lot of the time, the the search um, quality can be high. So, if someone's on ask.com and typing in family lawyer, that's fine. On Guardian and and similar like high quality websites like that, typing in family lawyers, they're looking for family lawyer. I don't know why they type in family lawyer on the Guardian, but it's just an example. But you'd match the ads based on the search intent from the Guardian. So. In this example, it's fine, but other ones, they could be looking for an article in the Guardian rather than than a Google ad trying to sell a service there. So it, it's, it is a slightly different intent, as you can see already. And these are, I suppose, two very good examples. There's thousands, if not millions of um, search partners across uh, the world um, from like tiny websites. You've got a CSE and have linked it to their ad sense. So it's just one to, to flag. So is search partner traffic effective? Sometimes is what we'll say. So first step, if you've got search partners uh, active in your accounts, you can check performance, go segment and then network with search partners. So really easy to see. 
And here's just an example here. Um, performance looks great from this, uh, from search partners. So Google search search partners. So the average cost per click is what? Three times less. The spend is, is significant, but it's less. The conversions are more. So we're spending less and we're getting more conversions. I'll, I'll take you all the way back. Well, actually, it's a bit of a spoiler. Um, cost conversions, £20 versus £43. And conversion rate is is slightly lower, but the lower CPC. So on the whole, look, Search Partners is doing great for me. Why would I ever want to remove it? Um, but a couple of question marks here, which maybe leads to where I'm going with this. So I'll take you all the way back to the, the start of the, the webinar when um, I said the, the data that you've got in Google Ads is only as good as the... Um, sorry, the optimization you make in Google Ads is only as good as the data that you put in. So in this example, uh, thank, thankfully, we could see post lead activity. So if anyone watching lead gen or just, you know, I suppose common sense dictates that a lead is only as good as how high quality that lead is. If, if every single lead is just asking for the company's name, then you wouldn't get too far. But on this example, so Google search more costly, it's got less leads. But if you look at quality leads, so let's say a quality lead converts to a sale when someone's put a lot of information, given a lot of information, looks like they're ready to buy, um, then, you know, Google search had 25 versus three on search partners. So the quality lead rate is 8% for Google search, less than a percent for search partners. So 10 times worse for search partners. So it's providing leads, but not very good quality ones. And then it comes to the rub in terms of cost per quality lead rather than cost per lead. It's, you know, five times higher on search partners. So as an optimization decision to reduce waste, you'd have to start really seriously thinking about removing search partners if this was the case. So why is this the case? As I said, the intent isn't the same as Google search. You get some search partner placements where the intent is the same and performance can, the CPCs can be cheaper and performance can be good. But the next point is not all search partners will perform the same and there is no visibility on, you can't see, oh, I had 5% from the Guardian, 3% for Ask and, and things like that. It's, it's you get a line item which is search search partners cost versus um and 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 the stats after that and I've, I've put in quotes here dishonest parties because I, like I'm not throwing any accusations here but um whenever there's a, a a situation where um someone else is making money from clicks online it can introduce things like um bot traffic and the rest of it I, I would say here Google is very good at identifying bot traffic but and um, that is just something you need to consider because when it's on Google search, you know, Google's making the money. When it's Google search partners, Google and someone else. So always you've got to think about that. Um, so as a checklist, what can you do? Um, so search partner performance, uh, if it's not hitting your KPIs, you're thinking, look, I'm just not happy with the traffic. Unfortunately, there's not much more you can do than turning it on and off because uh, there is no way to bid down by 50% or, or whatever the case is. It's just literally, it's that setting, you have it on or off. Um, so check it at account level, see what it's like. If it's about equal with Google search, probably keep it just in case. Um, if it, although if it's significantly worse, the idea is you take that wasted, quote unquote wasted spend and reinvest it in Google search and the campaigns are, are performing higher. Um, campaigns can perform differently at search partners. So you can go campaign by campaign. It could be, again, it's a softer way of doing it, excluding some campaigns. And the final point is uh, check search terms. This is a bit of a, a weird one, but it's one if you go in your account and you see search partner traffic's high, look in the search terms um, and look for super long strings, uh, eight words plus, because they're almost always search partners. Because one thing I didn't actually mention at the start was search partners is mainly search engines, but it can also match to intents of a website's breadcrumb trail and that's the search term is basically the breadcrumb trail so it's a little suppose easter egg that you can check and, and what you can do is, is negate those keywords in 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 your uh, process just like fraser was saying if if they aren't performative performance goals it's a very uh, kind of unique one and you'd have to check your accounts if that is happening it'd be interesting again i'd quite like to hear if, if someone has got that and, and and has learned that um it's in an email after um getting a bit tight in time for Q&A, so I'll just quickly run through this. The other one is Google Display Network. So that was the other auto opt-in that uh, we had at the start. Um, is my camera looking okay? Yeah, okay. Um, so Google Display Network is basically, and uh, you can show display ads across any site within the Google Display Network. So a couple of examples here again, Guardian and Daily Mail. So this is a Google Display ad uh, for Finisterre, and this is one for district on Daily Mail. So um, 
I would definitely recommend opting out of GDN from a search specific campaign because the metrics don't match up. Uh, the, the intent of traffic doesn't match up. You don't a lot of the time on, on GDN activity, you're not looking for a direct response. You're looking for awareness and you want to look at kind of softer goals as well. So definitely uh, on the whole, separate GDN activity into its own campaigns. Again, it's it's a bone of contention with the wider industry now with how Performance Max is going. But um, specifically with your display network activity, if you're showing display ads on placements and on The Guardian or wherever, you want to know that uh, it, you want to be looking at things like reach and things like how they interacted with the site because that's taking someone completely out their browsing habits whereas when someone's searching you want other you want to be optimizing of different networks so definitely if, if you're dedicating significant budget right now i'd split it out i'd also split new user activity versus remarketing uh, just because again you want to have different budgets for each you'd want to cap new user before remarketing so you want to have that campaign level a quick a, a really quick and this is a really good tip actually um Google can match your display ads to a lot of mobile apps and that can be great if you've got if you're running PPC for Clash of the Clans or I don't know Wordle app or something like that because you know it's, it's very you click on the app in the app store and you, you download the app however if you're a company with a website it's not to say definitely don't do it however if you launch GDN or have done GDN in the past the top 20 placements you'll see is likely to be mobile apps so I would say by default on any main campaigns, you want to negate that. Google's made it actually quite hard to negate it. So you need to put in this little weird string of code looking thing into the place uh, as a negative placement and that will exclude all apps. There is other ways to go about it, but that's a good good way to do it. And, and I mentioned there, you, you want to be optimizing off softer goals rather than what you're you're judging campaigns with uh, like search on so things like session duration and and softer things like email sign ups just just to give it a chance. So. Yes, OK, we raised through that because I wanted to give a, a decent amount of time for Q&A. Um, so, yeah, hopefully that all made sense and you can all um, have a think on questions that you may have. There's no, uh, it's not, if, if, you, if you want to have a question afterwards, I know it can be with sensitive data, for example, more than happy I'll come on the next slide, I'll give our details so you can give us an email or add us on LinkedIn to, to send us that, those questions. But if anyone does have a question now live, We'll you'll test our metal and see if we can answer it. Um, Hannah has got a few questions from people who have um, submitted them ahead of time, so thanks very much for that. She'll put these in the chat as well, and we'll um, answer those as well. But now I'm handing over to you guys for the next thirty seconds. Oh, oh it is Hannah's one, but anyone else can just jump in and and ask a question. So first question would be: What are the best practices around search campaign headlines? And descriptions to optimize towards click through rate. Um, I can take this one. Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. So I think that um, when it comes to ad writing, again, that has changed um, over the years. Um, we're now at a point now that um, in tandem, um, advertisers will be using both expanded text ads or ETAs, although that will be shifting come June to um, RSAs almost exclusively. So um, I can't remember what they're called before, really? but. Yeah, responsive search ads. Responsive search ads, but um, so they'll be the default um, as of later this year and advertisers will no longer be able to update ETAs. Um, I think the same process applies in terms of the answer to the question is um, relevancy is key. And that starts, um, although it will feed into your ads, that starts with your structure. Um, now really you're wanting to have a structure that is granular enough i'd say that's important nowadays due to the kind of matching of keyword terms but you're still wanting to differentiate different terms into different ad groups and that will allow you to show as relevant an ad as possible on keywords that are relevant to the ad group and subsequently relevant to that ad so i think when it comes to um, composing ads and description lines um, i think keyword stuffing is maybe going a bit far but yeah. absolutely you're wanting to include the core or hero term of the ad group within the headlines. Um, and that can be a headline one, it can be headline two or three, or again, going into the kind of different RSA format, but definitely including the um, the relevant uh, ad group name or keyword within the headline is super important. That's not changing. Um, and then having a differentiation between your diff other headlines is there. You may want to inc uh, include business USPs, test different call to actions, 
Um, but I say fundamentally, including yeah. the keyword in the ad is very, very important. I, I totally agree. I'd say just I, I would say description is good to add context, but I don't think a lot of people read descriptions. Um, apologies, I might be oversimplifying that. And we do try and write as good descriptions as we can. But I think the point is I think headlines are super important. So if you've got things like free delivery or really core values that you need to get across or any differentiator with the competitors, I would always say after your root theme, put your core USPs, free delivery, like, you know, anything that, that really sets you apart as a business. And then uh, similar with site links, they really pop off. Um, so the next question is, What's your opinion regarding Hagakure? Hage this is a, and this is an advanced question. Hagakure, I can't pronounce that structure. Have you implemented such an approach to any client? If so, did you see an improvement? So Hagakure, is that the um, structure where it's like one one keyword ad groups? I, I think it is, but um, you can maybe clarify in there. I, th I think it's like very, very bespoke, um, a very bespoke keyword where it's like every single keyword, every single ad, word, uh, every single ad group is, um, bespoke, and I think there, there's maybe broad keywords that you find out where the performance is coming from, and then you you add the broad keywords into their their own ad group. I would say any structure like that, Google has is kind of steamrolling a little bit in their matching because it shows the importance of negatives um, at, at the start. And and I think we we mentioned Ingram reports, but that's the kind of lifeblood of what we do. Is you need to be you need to understand. Um, the, th the query themes that are performing because there's less information on, on a campaign by cam campaign basis. But yeah, I would say that Google's matching, it means that one keyword will never just match, an exact keyword will never just ongoing match to that keyword uh, forever on. It's it, it can change the, the, the phrasings around it if it sees it as a close variant. Um, so our, our structures have changed. We've tried that type of structure in the past. I just don't think in 2022 you can do that. Um, yeah, I think we saw a lot of success um, really over a three year period to say 2016, 2017, 2018. But then as Rory says, through the changing of match types and the kind of the volume of keywords that even exact match terms can match to, it's a lot harder to get success from that structure. Yeah. Um, but as Rory says again, emphasis on search queries, it's super important to be checking those and making sure your data is clean as possible. No pun intended. Yes. Yeah. Nice. Um, cool. Is it possible to know how much your competitors are spending? So there's a really good report in Google Ads, which is called Auction Insights. Um, and what, uh, at, for any group of campaigns that you've got live, you can group them together or individual campaigns and see what your competitor, what positions that your competitors were in auctions that you also appeared on. So there's a few things here. Um, it, you can't know what they're spending, but you can get an idea of what they're spending. If you know that you spent a thousand pounds on a campaign and you appeared in most impressions for the keywords in that, and then you've got go into the auction insights and then you see that core competitors, 80% of impressions and they're they're above you about 50% of the time. So you're above them 50% of the time. You'll say, well, look, 80%, they're probably spending about 800 pounds or, or they'll be spending close to what we're spending on that campaign. Uh, a couple of things I would say here, though, is it's all relevant to how to your keywords. So if you're limited in your keywords due to your um, products and stock and the rest of it, then it's not going to tell you what they're actually spending. For example, a lot of our advertisers are in competition with Amazon and it tells us what, how much our ads have spent in comparison to Amazon, but we've got no idea what Amazon are spending because they've, they've got a billion categories, whereas we're just in certain niches for certain advertisers. So it is a really good one and, and on tighter markets, you can set up reports so you can almost, when competitors in the auction insights drop off, you might want to make a decision, like push up your spend or um, similarly, if you're thinking, wow, my CPCs have really increased in the last few weeks, you go on Auction Insights and you're like, wow, who are these two competitors? They have are appearing on more terms and now they're in positions above me more. So that's another really good one to, to, to go in. And we definitely advocate looking at the Auction Insight data and splitting it by both um, day of week and also dev by device, because that can be a really good way to see what particularly the larger competitors are doing in those auctions, and it may be something that you're missing out on at the moment um, that others in the industry are, are actioning. 
Cool. Is there any other questions uh, live? And ho hopefully um, I, I answered that question. Hagakuri Haga structure. It's uh, that's a good question. Um, any other live questions? I've got one from Hannah, which is, is one from before the 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 pre prepared not pre prepared but one sent in before. Uh, where should I be pulling conversion data from? Can I use can I use offline data? Uh, where should I be pulling conversion data from? Can I use offline data? So this, I think this means um, specific to, um, so in that example I gave in terms of anything post delete. So that does need to come from, uh, I'm, I'm assuming if you're generating leads, you should have a, a CRM which captures information post lead and for salespeople to, to contact and the rest of it. And, and similarly, if you're e-commerce, you'll have a, a, a back end which will show things um, like actual sales and the rest of it. So yeah, it's it's um, hooking up in some way the CRM with Google Ads. And that doesn't mean to say directly linking them, although that is possible. If you've got Salesforce, it's really easy. Easy. It's not easy using Salesforce, but um, you can link CRM to Google Ads. However, um, what can also happen is I mentioned G Seal ID, Google Click ID. So you can get that information passing through a sale or a, a sale or a lead form. It's all it is is a bit like an, a, a string of code basically that pulls through and it makes it makes the CRM know that OK, this user is linked to using the CRM is linked to the click in, in Google Ads. And it, for anyone who's not that technically advanced, I suppose, from a CRM perspective, you can just get a, an export of that G Seal ID and upload it into Google Ads and it will update the conversion value with whatever value you put in there. So it's super. I mean, that this functionality has been around for a few years, um, but I'm still oh, not seeing a lot of companies utilize it. And um, so it's super useful and it can really move the dial because in the example earlier, if if when you upload that GCL ID information back into Google Ads, you'll say, wow, 18 to 24 year olds are just terrible at converting through to applications. You wouldn't have known that other than looking at your own data and, and somehow trying to manipulate uh, Google Ads otherwise. Whereas if it's automatically pulling through, then it will just tell you exactly over 100 different um, breakdowns where you can push and pull uh, budget to save. And it can it can absolutely change um, how you can look at data and operate as a business. So for night, um, we rolled out the uh, kind of offline uploads back into Google um, back in, I believe, 2016 for a client. Um, and at the time, we were really investing into desktop spend. That looks to be where the main competition was. After a few weeks and months of actually importing that data back into Google, we really quickly identified that actually mobile was where yeah. both deal value and click volumes were going. And so overnight, our strategy changed to being mobile first, and that had a massive impact right away. Yeah, for sure. For sure, for sure. Will Performance Max campaigns change how we need to set up a Google Ads campaign? Um, so, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, the setup for performance max is incredibly easy and um, you all you, you need to provide assets um, I could I could do a whole nother webinar on, on, on this as well and um, so it's still not incredibly clear in terms of the best strategy for performance max is it one campaign uh, for uh, Joe Sneaker Club you have one campaign and just say well look Google with you've got my feed you've uh, you've got my website just go in go crazy to try and figure out the best ROI for us. Um, and what you need to do is give assets based on um, different parts of the feed. So you can split it out like Nike trainers and Adidas trainers or whatever the case is. Um, so it does change. If you want to do performance max, you can do it within Google Ads if that was the question. So on that slide, uh, we went through like that as a campaign type. We can choose uh, performance max. And then you just go through the process. It's slightly different. You, you need to provide as much, as many assets as possible, because if you provide Google with few assets, shall we say, um, it can give a wor worse performance. And, and the, the big one is the YouTube. Mm -hmm. Like it will, sh it yeah. will create a YouTube video based on the text and images you provide, and put stock mu music over it. it was, we've seen a few. Uh, 
um, and hopefully I was trying to get an example, but I've just seen them live and they don't look great. I'd imagine Google will improve that, but it can only improve it so much when it's got stock photos and text. There's no way for you to say to Google, I don't want to show on YouTube. Not that I believe anyways. So it will always do that and you'll always have a video somewhere shown to someone um, based on your criteria that there's a YouTube video out there. So I'd always say if you're going to do Performance Max, have some kind of video which is better than that. Um, so yeah, you need to you need to put all the assets in on launch and make them as good as possible. Link them to the website as closely as possible in themes. But even then, that you're not going to have control over, like you couldn't necessarily stop showing on use trainers, for example. Uh, it doesn't work quite the same as what we're going through. Um, but yeah, honestly, I we could talk for another couple of hours on performance max. So yeah, absolutely. And I think that something we always talk about um, internally as an agency when we're um, discussing options on smart campaigns and particularly performance max over the last you know few weeks and few months is is the the term data discount. And I think that with the lack of data that we're able to get out of both smart campaigns and um and performance max campaigns i think it's very very important that advertisers understand that and actually maybe take a step back and understand the importance of, to data to themselves as a business if you're happy just to get your you know five to one ten to one or whatever your last target may be uh blindly you know you can get it from google you, know, you don't, don't care how the sausage is made as they say then performance max may be an option for you but if you're relying on that data to power other business decisions across across the organization, then it may be worth taking a step back. And if you'd still want to go down the road of performance max, giving yourself a data discount. So what that means would be if you need five to one to be profitable as a business, maybe look at actually moving that up in terms of the ROAS target you're setting to six or seven, you know, factoring out that you're not going to get any insights from those campaigns other than I've spent X and then the campaigns gave me back Y. Yeah. So that's very important to consider when setting up campaigns. Sure. Um, I'll, I'll, can I answer the last one? I just want to um, just outline here that uh, thanks to everyone for joining. Um, what what we'll do is we'll send around the slides, um, but also just want to outline that definitely do get in touch. If you've heard something in this presentation and you think, um, look, I'll look at my account and give us an example or give us a specific problem. It can be completely unrelated to this. Um, Self and Fraser are happy to help for the next few weeks. So uh, there are, there's our email. So rory at cleandigital.co.uk and fraser at cleandigital.co.uk. Um, so yeah, that's that'd be great. Another thing, I know there's a few people dropping off because it's coming to 11. And um, if you did want to, we might, we're, we're planning on doing another webinar, Performance Max Deep Dive, um, Google Analytics 4 set up and reporting tips or getting business data back into PPC platforms. Um, you can either spam in the chat or when we when you email separately, if you can just uh, outline what you'd like to see. We've already got a vote for GA4 setup, so that's that's a good one. That's very hot, a very hot topic. Yeah. Um, if you don't, if you haven't set up GA4, then um, by June next year, then you're not going to have analytics data. It's as serious as that because Google's retiring its old properties. It's a big and one. It's, and it's completely new codes and completely new transitions. So there's one vote for that. But if people can get reach out separately and just have a suggestion, happy to go into other things as well. But yeah, thank you very much for your time. I think we'll call it there. Call it bang on 11. Thanks very much for your time. And yes, oh, second vote for GA4. It's a popular one. <laughs> um, so yes. Do reach out with any questions. We're happy to help. And yeah, hope you've enjoyed. Yeah, please let us know on LinkedIn if you enjoyed the session. We'd really appreciate um, connecting with both Roy and I and following Clean Digital. We tried to give out as many kind of tips in the industry yeah. as possible. Um, but get, guys, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we hope you've taken a few things away and you can apply them to your own campaigns today. Um, yeah. And let us know how you get on. We'd really appreciate that. Um, thanks again. Cheers, guys. Bye.